the guys. They do a sweet job. They do a sweet job. <clears throat> well, it's good to be home. I've been gone for two weeks. I've been in South Carolina. I began to talk different just in a short period of time, y'all. <laughs> um, a lot of people missing. Pastor Wayne's recovering from his knee replacement. We're going to call him Robo Pastor from now on. He's got a new knee in there. He's recovering well. Sends his love. Um, to a few of you, not all of you, but he sends his love to some of you and stuff like that. Um, took, used my vacation time throughout the summer to help get some of the homes open. The, the summer has been so fast paced between since April 1st to now. Um, we, I'll give you some updates on those things um, coming up. Now we started sort of a new season next week. We got a new series coming up, um, 15 Tools of the devil. Fifteen things that devil uses in every believer's life, in every church's life, what he's been using in some cases centuries, and maybe some of these tools that he's been using just for um, um, a time such as this in the United States of America, in the, in the world system as we know it today. I think it's going to be an interesting series, and we have some new classes starting up probably in, in late October and things like that. But this message I wasn't able to really log on while I was gone. I was living in the woods, and um, literally, I couldn't. I had a very difficult time even talking on the phone. Um, There's no cell service. My Wi-Fi I had hooked up was wasn't really worth that much, and um, yet, so I could have had a difficult time. Then I would drive into the city, which was 20 minutes away. It wasn't really much of a city, but there was actually other people there, and um, and there was my phone would blow up, just emails, text messages, phone messages. It's been sitting around in space for me to come back to earth. And um, so I had a really difficult time communicating, um, keeping up with my communication while I was gone. So if you didn't get a call back from me, it really wasn't because of lack of effort. I, I, I didn't know you had called until sometimes it was, it was too late. I was in my private devotions. Um, this is probably two months ago, and this is where this message was born um, in my heart, and it was very comforting to me and very convicting to me and very inspiring to me. And I hope that as you hear the Word of God today, you'll let the Word of God speak to you personally and independently, because that's the whole key here. What applies to me and what, how it speaks to me is not necessarily how he's going to speak to you. So I, so I ask that you hear this message as I hear every message subjectively in a sense like, God, what do you want to speak to me? How does this work in my life? Because what God's doing in you and what God's doing in me is very different. It always is very different, isn't it? We're all different places. We all have our different um, bag, baggages. Now, I was reading just it's my normal Bible reading. I wasn't looking for any great, um, so I never do. I just sort of read the scriptures every morning. And I read the parable of the talents, or the mirrors, as we'll see in a moment. And God really spoke to me here. And I pray that he speaks to you too. Because one of the, the least apprehended aspects, I think, of our Christian life in America 2017, and this is the, our audience, this is our world, is the purpose of the church. You guys, I know Pastor Bernstein has been sort of working on that uh, from a lot of different angles in the classes. The purpose of the church, and, and not only the purpose of the church, but our roles as individuals in that church. Now, when I say church in that, I don't necessarily mean Grace Connection Church, even though that would have application there. I'm talking about my place in the kingdom of God, the, the universal body of Christ. There's no mistake that you are alive in 2017 and you're living in the United States of America. That didn't happen by lottery. That happened by divine design. And there's a reason for that. What happens with us, I think, is we define our purpose to God. Um, in other words, I looked at God and say, okay, this is what your plan is for my life, if I even think that deeply. And I sort of let life just sort of take me through whatever life takes me through. But I think there are few in this age where let, let lets God define their purpose for them. You'll see throughout the scriptures, God all of a sudden puts a call on a man or a woman. And it wasn't really on their radar screen, but God says, now I have a plan for you and a purpose for this. What does God want me to do with my life? 
Now, that's a good question that you can ask when you're a teenager graduating high school. And usually you're thinking, well, I have to pick a career. Back when we had a Christian school, I had a dear friend of mine, Steve Schneiderman. Some of you remember Steve. Steve's in heaven right now, and he was a quadriplegic. Steve was a very intelligent man, um, didn't know how to really deal with kids that well. And um, so he had a little, he had a little um, um, five-year-old, and it was Amy West, uh, it was a little five-year-old in kindergarten, and Amy um, um, Epperson, as we know, as she grew up in our church, and he sat her down. Amy had done something wrong, and Amy's five, and, and, and Steve's looking at her and says, Amy, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> You've got to start thinking about these things, you know. You've got to start thinking. Of, and there's Amy's like, I just want to, I just want to, I want a Capri Sun. Uh, that's, that's what I want. And, um, and so he, he, she really sort of forced the question probably a little bit before it's time. But that was Stephen. So, so it was, um, so, uh, but as we get older and as we face these different things in our life, we ask, what does God really want from me? Now, I think I was blessed, and I also think I was unique in the sense, like I was born again at 19 years old when I met the Lord, and he spoke to me clearly and said, I want you to be a preacher of my gospel. Now, I knew that from day one. Now, I don't say that from, um, from a subjective point. I just knew God called me to do exactly what I'm doing. It didn't happen the next week. It took about 10 plus years before I, it was realized but I got on the road of that, and, but, but God doesn't always speak that way to all of us all the time. Now, here's the trick. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself in the message. How he spoke to me 20 years ago and 30 years ago might not be how he speaks to me now. I know that's not right. And I know that God is supposed to run his plans through our life. He's supposed to send me an email and say, Tim, this is what I want to do. Do I get your approval? But he doesn't do that, does he? So I think we need to answer this question. What does God want from me? You can be a housewife. You could be a student. You can be a senior citizen. But we can never stop asking ourselves that. God, what do you want from me? In my life. Now, in this account in Luke 19, the people, uh, they still hope for a political leader. That was sort of true even after the resurrection. They thought Jesus was going to come back and set up his kingdom. He didn't understand. He tried to tell them, I'm going to go away for a while. But while I'm away, I want you guys, my followers, to be faithful and to perform and to do these certain tasks and to represent me while I'm gone. There was a purpose. I want, I'm leaving, but now in John 17, so send I you. So I want you to represent me while I'm gone. I'm giving you a purpose. I'm leaving. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect, but I'm going to ascend into heaven. I'm going to send my comforter in you and give you my spirit. So you can be a witness to me into the uttermost parts of the world. Just for the first 20 years. And after that, you're on your own. <laughs> no. He says, no, I'm going to be a witness. And I'm going, to, I'm going to, my church, my people, from this point forward until I come again and really establish my kingdom, are going to be just that. My representation. My witnesses. In Judea, Samaria, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And it will see in this account that we're going to read, he doesn't take that command lightly. It's not something to be dismissed easily. It has no age out clause. It has no too young clause. It has no you're not old enough clause. It, it just is ongoing extension to every one of his people. Jesus wants us to all, and this is titled by message, invest the investment that he has in us. Would you all agree with me that Jesus has an investment in your life? He does. Through the Holy Spirit, through training, through giftedness, which we'll see and get into the message, 
and then through experience. Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. In other words, he was very close to being crucified here. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was about to appear, immediately appear, the disciples thought, Jesus is coming, this is going to be cool, the Romans are gone, he's going to rule the earth, and we're with them. It didn't quite work like that. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into the far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then, then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas um, and said to them, engage in business till I come. In other words, take these babies and invest them. But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came to him saying, Lord, your miner has made 10 miners more. I invested it and I made 10 times your money. That's a good investment. Probably well, she needs to be hired by Merrill Lynch. And he said to them, well done. Good servant, because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your miner has made five miners. And he said, and to you, you're going to be um, ruler over five cities. Then another one came, saying, Lord, here is your miner, your money, your investment, I, I, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. I sort of buried it because I didn't want to lose it, didn't trust myself. You want to make sure that you at least got your money back. For I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. Now take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not and you and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with my own words. You wicked servant. You knew I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank at my coming? I might have even collected a little interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from the man and give it to the one who has ten miners. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten miners. I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. But from the one who, was, who, who has not, even what he has will be taken away. It's quite a severe story. Jesus told it. Now, I'm not going to really get into the severity of it, but what I want you to see out of this is the solemnness of it. This wasn't something the Lord was taking lightly. He was ready to be crucified. He was looking at his disciples taking on his ministry, and he told them this parable. Here's the first thing that happens to us, I think. We refuse to acknowledge the mandate. We saw the mandate. We saw the Great Commission. The church, you and I, God's bride, is not here to just receive from God in the sense we're here to become like Christ, if I had to put a primary reason. We're supposed to be Christ-like. That's God's goal for our life is to become Christ-like. And in being Christ-like in our world, whatever that means, your world's going to be different than mine, but in Christ-like, we become effective witnesses because we take the character of God and the nature of God into our environment, into our world. He doesn't want me to be necessarily coddled, not to maintain my character, but be transformed into a different character. In other words, he doesn't want me to be the same guy 20 years from now that I am today. He doesn't want me to be some hothead blowing people away with my mouth of 20 years ago when I used to be that same hothead 20 years before or 20 years from now. He wants to take that character. He wants to take those insecurities. He wants to take those fears and transform them into something different, more like him. Some of us get so self-absorbed, so easily offended we put up our little walls and we withdraw from people. This person didn't text me back. Well, what did you do before text? <laughs> I instant messaged them and they didn't respond. Oh, I know it's hard. 
So text back. I don't think they like me. They might not. (laughs) That's okay. I'm sure you'll find one that does. Live like I live. Free. I just assume everyone likes me. And I make people tell me otherwise. And not one has done it yet. <laughs> so you're all my friends, right? Uh, give, me key, give me key to your houses. I'm, I'm coming over. I'm visiting you anytime. <laughs> we get so self-absorbed and make this about us when it's something bigger. That person did this or they did that. No, listen. It's never about that person. You're going to find all sorts of weird people in life. You can't let them sidestep you and take you off your stride. You have to be bigger than that. You have to see something kingdom-minded. The church, you and I, God's bride is here to represent Christ to the world. The church, God's bride is here to carry on the mission that Jesus started. That's why we're here. That's why you're here. 2017, the United States of America. Donald Trump's our president. Who would have figured? That's why we're here. To represent Jesus Christ. Not to win the next election. Not to increase my IRA. That may happen. We may get our next guy that we want elected. That may happen. Not to build my portfolio. That may happen. Not to find a husband or a wife. That may happen. Not to get my health issues cleared up. That may happen. But those are all just parts of life. That's part of our walk. We're here to represent Christ in the world. That's his overriding purpose for all of us. There's a verse, I think I already quoted it, John 17, verse 18, and he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to Jesus. I'm sorry. Jesus is talking to the Father, praying in this priestly prayer, John 17. The whole chapter needs to be read. It's an amazing chapter. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. His disciples. You and I are his disciples today. Watch this verse. This is an incredible verse. This is all part of the Ephesians 2 passage. When you read Ephesians chapter 2, and it just talks about the riches of Christ, really from verse 1 um, all the way right down to verse 10. It's all spiritual blessings, forgiven of sins. Uh, then the f- verse 2, 8 is we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man can boast. The whole ch- first 10 chapters are just a gold mine of Scripture. And then you come to chapter, verse 10. It's pretty interesting. Because here you are, you're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man can boast in in verse 8. And then uh, uh, two verses later, for we are his workmanship. That word in the Greek is poema, where we get our word poems from. Created where? In Christ Jesus. For good works. Well, I, I thought we were saved by grace, not of works, lest any man can boast. But here it says we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, God made us for a purpose. He didn't just invest in us through his Holy Spirit and gift us through his Holy Spirit. There's a purpose attached to the investment of his Holy Spirit in us, which God prepared before time that we should walk in them. So I have these good works that God wants me to walk in. Might be different than yours. In many cases, there are. They are very different. And the people that you can reach are not the people that I can reach. And the people I reach aren't the people that you can reach. God has these people he wants me to reach and throw out the mural of my life. But I can't get inside your world just like you can't really get inside mine. That's why we're the bride of Christ, the family of God. Our mission statement, Grace Connection Church exists to equip its members to carry the message of Jesus Christ where? Into their world. You see, God has invested in us. He's given us some minors. Uh, So one has one, one has five, one has ten, but we're supposed to take that and invest it. That's our job. Second thing, we refuse to acknowledge our personal mandate. Talk about the big mandate, macro sense. Now let's take it down to a micro sense. I agree, Pastor. Amen. But 
Now let's make it personal. What about me? We all have some type of fruit that God wants us to bear. I don't, I don't, um, I understand there could be confusion of what that is. But I hope it's at least a question in your mind. I hope it's something that you ask yourself. God is not done with you. I don't care if you're young, you're old, you're sick, you're in between. If Democrat, Republican, maybe if you're a Yankee fan, he's done with you. But outside of that, God is not done with you. There's a plan that he has for your life. I talked with a man this past week that um, he's been in, retired now for numerous years, and he's been invested. He saved very hard in his younger years and um, earned his money, invested it in a wide variety portfolio. And um, we were talking about his different investments he made, and he said, I've netted um, this year on my investments $130,000. It sounds, I mean, a lot of people make more than that or less than that. He, was, he did a good job investing. He has a good um, personal investor. So that was, he, that's what he's netted so far in 2017. Now, that could all be a loss tomorrow because um, he's divested in different mutual funds and things like that. But I thought it was interesting because we talked about that. He said, I could, if I put it in the bank, just put my money in the bank, the cost of living would have overwhelmed my interest. I would have actually been losing money just by putting my money, sort of burying it in the ground like the man with the one miner. So he invested it, ran a little bit of a risk, lost a bunch in 2008 like everyone else, recovered it all and is way above that now because he invested. He had this certain thing that was given to him to invest and he put it into an investment and it made interest. See, many of us will never invest the investment God has made in us for his kingdom. We, we limit God how God's going to use us. We think that somehow our physical limitations, our giftedness or lack of giftedness. Listen to this. This is amazing. A couple of examples. You know, Moses. We all know who Moses was. He's the guy with the beard that sounded like Charlton Heston. You know, he said, hey, we can... Put the cell phones down, that'd be good. Because I always forget to say that, but cell phones are distracting and everyone looks at the person with the cell phone. It might not even be him. It could be somebody else. So it's um so Moses was eighty years old. Think of that. Spent forty years in Egypt hanging out, lap of luxury, realized that did some bad things and life didn't go far with him. Well, ran out into the wilderness, went way, way far away, spent 40 years, got married, had a bunch of kids, had a bunch of cattle and sheep and stuff like that. Now he's 80. He's on the tail end, the last third of his life. He lived a little longer, baby, back then. He's just out there in the mountain with his sheep and all of a sudden a bush starts talking to him. He didn't smoke anything, didn't drink anything. It was really a talking bush. Moses! Put off your feet, you're on holy ground. I have a job for you, Moses. I want you to go to Egypt, go to the Pharaoh, and tell him to let all my people free. I've heard their groans, I've heard their prayers. Moses says, you know, God, I, I don't have that gift. First of all, I'm 80, and I'm just really just... My kids are all getting grown, and I'm trying to raise my sheep, and I've got a lot of stuff on my plate here. I'm, 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 I'm thought by this time of my life, my course would be well set. You want me to do what? Go to Egypt, where I left and ran as a criminal, and go to the Pharaoh and say, set my people free? And I'm going to give you this staff, and I'm going to be behind you. And I, but I, I can't even talk right. He goes, I'll send Aaron with you. He's got a big mouth. And be a spokesman. Just go. That's my purpose for you. Now it's interesting because why didn't he do it 40 years earlier? He wasn't ready. Or the world's timing wasn't right. Why didn't he do it when he was 20 years old, prime of life? Wasn't ready. Probably would have ran away from the burning bush. <laughs> He waited till he was 80. So he had these gifts for Moses, 
that he gave them, these leadership gifts. Didn't know he had. He was just raising sheep for the last 40 years of his life. He had a call on Moses' life. He didn't know what he had. He had a divine purpose for his life to set his whole nation free, that we're still talking about that to this day. The whole world knows who Moses is. And until God set him free, he was on the backside of a desert, raising sheep. There was no time limit to his, his calling. It took him 80 years of preparation. 80 years of living life, 80 years of falling flat on the face, 80 years of raising kids, 80 years of making bad decisions, 80 years of watching the faithfulness of God, 80 years of being um, faithful, being beat up, making mistakes, falling down, getting up, dusting yourself off, falling down, getting up, dusting yourself off, 80 years. And God says, now it's time to those creaky old bones and go to Egypt and lead my people. Caleb, 40 years old, he goes into Kadesh Barnea with Joshua and comes out and said, we can take this land. You know the story, Numbers 14, 13, 14. Only two faithful men. God judges all of Israel and said, there's only three people going to make it in the promised land too, really. Moses, I'm sorry, Moses never made it either. Caleb and Joshua, the two ones that came out with a good report. That's awesome. It's just not going to happen for 40 years. I'm 80 years old. Caleb's 80 now. He says, all right, we're ready. Let's go get the mountain that God promised me. I'm as young as I was, strong as I was 40 years ago. I'm ready. It took 80 years to get Caleb ready. God had invested in him. God had invested in Moses for that moment. So they invested the investment God had. When you look at some of the famous missionaries, one of them, some of you might not have heard of, is a C.T. Studd. An amazing story, um, great biography written by his son-in-law, Norman Grubb. He, um, C.T. Studd was, he went, worked with J. Hudson Taylor. He was a famous cricketer in England. He um, was very, very wealthy, decided to sort of turn his back on the wealth and went onto the mission field in India and China. And then he came back, pastored a church for a few years in the England area. I might have some of these details. So I'm going by memory here. And then God put a heart on him. He went to the Sudan. He saw the depravity and the, the awful conditions of the way the people lived. And he says, I think God wants me to go to China, I mean to Africa. Well, CT, you're, you're, you're sick, you have health issues, the mission board, you're 60 years old, that country's full of disease, I, um, I don't think it's good for you to go, I don't think we're going to send you, we're not gonna, we're not, we don't want to be responsible for you. He says, well, I know God wants me to go. So his wife stays home and raises money. They start a missions fund, and she stays home. He goes to Africa. And for the next, I think, 15 years of their life, they saw each other one time, and he died of gallstones in the Belgium Congo with his daughter and Norman Grubb by his side. He um, wouldn't listen to the voice of man. He wouldn't listen to his physical body. He knew what God had put on his heart. He knew there was an investment in him that now he wanted to invest back. He said this, some of you heard this statement, it's a great one. This is after working with J. Hudson Taylor. He said, some want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within the yard of hell. He took his miners and invested them. Listen, refuse to invest the investment God has made in People refuse to invest in the investment God has made in us. That's how I meant to say it. He invests in us all very differently. And I don't have much, much more to say here. He gifts us all differently. He gave me gifts that you don't have. He gave you gifts I don't have. Some of the gifts I have, 
aren't realized and haven't been realized. Some of the gifts you have, you don't even know you had them yet. And you can't take the gifts of God that he gives us and detach them from the timing of God. In other words, he may give me this gift that lies dormant for 20 or 30 or 40 or 80 years in my life until God says, now I want you to use this gift. You've always had it. I just haven't needed you to use it yet. So now I want you to use that gift that God has given us. Then he prepares us to use our giftedness. I mean, I knew I was called to preach, and, and I knew that, and that was a good thing. Not everyone knows, gets it that clearly like I did. I, I understand that. But then I went to education. I went and got trained in, in institutions and so I could do it right and properly. And, and then, I, then life happened. You know, kids came. There were sick kids, and there was a sick, sickness in my home. My wife got very ill for a decade, and... There was failures and getting up and dusting myself off. Then there was a loss of our daughter. All those things that make up who we are, God takes that. He takes our giftedness. He puts it into a test tube, and he says, now it's time. Now you can do what I've asked you to do. Not that you haven't been. You have. But now for this phase of your life, being my child, being a part of my church, I prepared you for this. I prepared you through experience. I prepared you through living. I prepared you through breathing. I prepared, I prepared you through loss and heartache and grief and emotional pain and physical pain. I prepared you for this moment. You don't have to find the moment. The moment will find you. You just got to be willing to walk through the door when it opens. We, you, me, have all been prepared through all life to be the bride of Christ in America in 2017, whatever that means to your world. I ask myself this question, what am I missing if I don't seek that out? What am I not seeing if I don't say, God, you have something so much bigger for me than just the American dream. You have something profound for me, which may mean reaching one person. That may be how, how profound it is. And that one person may reach one person, and that person may reach one person, and that person may reach 10,000. But it started somewhere. No, let me just close with this. I don't really think these next verses are even seriously considered by probably 95% of the believers in America. I, I don't have the book up here. I meant to bring it up here. It's interesting that I'm saying this. I was just reading a part of my devotions, Alan Redpath's book um, from the 50s, Blessings Out of Buffetings. It's a commentary, ongoing devotional commentary from 2 Corinthians. So I just looked up what he said on these verses, and it was really very, very, very... I wanted to read it to you. It happened this morning, so I couldn't get on the screen. And then I, something happened to me that happens to me quite often. I forgot. <laughs> I left it in my office. I said, well, I'm going to read that. They're going to love this. No, no, you have to take my word for it that you would have liked it. Let me read you these verses. For we all must stand before the judgment, before Christ to be judged. This is a New Living Translation. So we must, three-letter word, all stand before Christ to be judged. We will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body because we understand, Paul is speaking, he didn't take this lightly. We understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord. And we work hard to persuade others. God knows we're sincere, and I hope you know this too. So Paul's saying this is a fearful, awesome, that's the word fearful, this awesome responsibility to the Lord. We understand that someday, this moment, this judgment, this isn't a judgment of eternal destiny. We've been over that a thousand times. This is a judgment for me, God's child, his church, his bride, of what we did with the investment he invested in us. 
What have I done with my minor? What have I done with my talent? What have I done with what God, my giftedness and my experience and the pain that God has brought into my life? Or has my Christian life just been reduced to something that happens on Sunday morning, which would be a tragedy? Erwin Luther said the judgment seat of Christ is to our shame almost universally ignored by Christians. Most of whom I've talked with thinks it will not be a very significant event. It's going to be huge. It screams throughout the scriptures, John 4, I mean, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A.J. Gordon said years ago, I cannot think of a final divine reckoning which shall assign the same rank and glory, the degree of joy to a lazy indolent, an unfruitful Christian as to an ardent, self-denying Christian. In other words, he's saying, for somebody who's counted the cost, invested the investment, we just read it in the parable, did he all get the same reward? Rewards matter. A lot. It changes the face of our eternity. Not the destiny of our eternity, but the quality of our eternity. Rademacher said, the person, I am become, the person I am become today is preparing me for the person I shall be for all eternity. So God says, hey, I'm going to give you the investment. The investment of pain, the investment of loss, the investment of wisdom the investment of experience, and the the investment of education, and the investment of just simple gifts of my spirit. Some are going to get one gift or two gifts. Some are going to get a dozen of them. It doesn't matter what I give you. It just matters that you invest it right. I'm not looking for results as much as I'm looking for faithfulness because faithfulness is what matters. Not just for those who receive the award but for those who will be touched by the investment God has made in us my friends the, the world is depending on us we are, we are all it has Jesus thank you for these precious people precious in your sight precious in mine as we do every opportunity here at Grace Connection, if you're here and have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, quiet place of your heart between you and the Lord, say the simple prayer after me. The prayer doesn't save you. It's God reading your language of your heart that makes the difference. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Come into my life and save me. This is my day of eternal life. This is the day I give my heart to you for salvation. This is the day I begin my walk and my journey. If you said that prayer in your own way, your heart cried out to God today. Just let the person who brought you know or let somebody know on the way out. Jesus, you never cease to amaze me what you do in my own life. From the experiences you've given me to the pain and the plan, the open doors, the shut doors, the dead ends and the open highways. I have ceased to try to figure you out, God. So I pray for myself and I pray for all of us. Show me the open door with my neighbor. Show me the the open door with the person who works in the cubicle next to me. Show me the open door to the person in the hospital that I work with or the job site, my employee or my employer. Father, show me what talent you have given me, what minor, what investment you've made in me. Maybe it's just the investment of empathy and love and support or a cup of cold water in Jesus' name so I can give it away to somebody else. God, I don't want to be the one who buries it. 
I don't want to be the one who takes what you've given me and put it in the ground so I don't lose it. I want to be one that gives it away so it bears fruit that will last forever and ever and ever. Bless our offering we're about to give now, Father. We understand as part of our worship. We worship you through your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.